the Lean Guys. Uh, today is a special episode because we've got all four of the planned Lean Guys together and our worlds are officially colliding. So welcome Mike Floyd, Mike Letson, and as always, Johnny Hustle. Good to be here, Dennis. Greetings, guys. So um, I was hoping today, Letson, you could do a little icebreaker for us. Do you have that jam with the cards you could explain a little bit for us? I do. Uh, and I'd like to uh, offer it to Mike first since uh, Uncle D and Johnny Hustle already know about it. So a uh, real simple game. I have five cards uh, in my hand. They all have uh, terms or words uh, on them. I pick them at random. Uh, what I need for you to do is pick a number between one and five. I'll uh, read that card off to you, and then you just tell a, a one-minute story uh, or so about that. Oh, okay. So, fair All enough? Right. Yeah, fair enough. All right, go ahead and pick a number, one to five. Uh, four, please. Two, three, four. Uh, onions. 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 Story about onions, huh? Onions. It's funny. Uh, you hear the term... Uh, peel back the onion or peel the layers of the onion, right? So I've been doing a lot of cooking lately. Uh, it's a great analogy because it's an interesting, is it a fruit or a vegetable? I'm not too sure. But it has such big analogy in everything we're doing, right? Usually the problems we have are five, six layers deep. And everyone thinks it's on the outer layer. Oh, no, it's got to be the next layer. My gosh, guys, how many times have we found out it's at the core and you really got to peel that back? So and then the other thing I'm thinking, I'm kind of a cheap guy too. How much of the onion do you need to peel off before you can serve the rest of it to your family? There's that little skin on the top, but it still yeah. looks kind of nappy. But you look around, you go, hell, I'm going to cook it anyway. <laughs> and then the other ones you do, you take too much, and then your onion's like that big around, and you're like, Jesus. So anyway, I'm not too sure. I, I'm, I'm perplexed, but that's my onion story. Fair that's enough. That's all. That's it how the game. It is fair enough, and I think as the as the layers as you go deeper, it makes you cry more. Is that what it is? It gets more potent. It gets yeah. just more painful. You just start yeah. you know, bawling. So there's your another. There's your second analogy. That's perfect. Right, right. Five layers deep into five wise. You just like you know looking yeah. for the corner to curl up in. I like it. Thank you, Mike. Funny. Is anyone else playing, or is that the end of the game? Well, if you want to keep going, we can. Let's save it. All right. We got a lot to, <laughs> we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> what I want to do is uh, see if we can't follow up with some of the things that we've been discussing. Um, we had an, a collaboration discussion before Mike, Letson, Mike Floyd joined us. And then with Mike Floyd, we had a concurrent engineering conversation. And Johnny, I was hoping today that you could take us through a discussion about the process of innovation itself. You know, we... Everyone talks about innovation and being innovative and ideating and all this other kind of stuff. But if you don't intentionally do it uh, and you don't follow a proven process for it, I think you're in for spending too much money on your new product innovation. I don't know how else to say it. But well, can you help us with that? we got lots of stories to back that up too, um, you know, but you know, to your point, the, the very first uh, thing that we want to discuss is that just putting a bunch of smart people in a room and say, come out with a good idea uh, isn't really innovation. You know, um, uh, I'm not sure what you'd call that other than a boondoggle, you know, for a bunch of people to stand, sit in a room and, and not do much. Um, so, and also you're putting an awful lot of pressure on them to come up with something that eventually will sell. Or, or you're hoping it will, uh, and in many cases, no one's ever even asked the customer. So you know? if, there, if you can't command innovation, so as to say you guys go innovate right now, then how do you, how do you, how do you foster it? Uh, well, you really get to follow a, a process, and, uh, and I want to jump back a little bit and point out that um, the genesis of us really getting into innovation as a process, uh, because, you know, up, up until that point, I already had a few uh, products that I designed and commercialized. And, you know, I felt like I was a pretty good innovator on, on, on my own right. Um, but then I got challenged by a gentleman named Mike Floyd, who happens to also be on this call with us. And um, 
he, he, he put two things together in one comment that uh, made us think about uh, innovation completely different. First of all, he said, geez, you know, you really got to be thinking about the customer's tough problem. And he also threw the notion of collaboration at us and how both of those at the same time were uh, exceedingly important uh, in order for us to have a fighting chance of building something that was actually going to be useful. Yeah. So uh, Mike, there must have been some sort of uh, a reason why you clumped those two uh, items together and, and opened up that conversation with us uh, uh, at the first point, wasn't there? Yes, uh, and I'm assuming when you talk about collaboration, you're including the customer in that process, right? Customer and the extended supply chain. Absolutely. Yeah. And, right. and oddly enough, that you, 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 your assumption is correct. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, many of our clients never ask the customer. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, John, many clients don't even collaborate within their company. They won't even bring the downstream elements of their company to that party, to that innovation party, right? <clears throat> let alone the customer, let alone what Dennis just said on the supply chain. And, and yet, if you looked at what's been most successful for us, and I'm including you guys in this with the help that you've provided our company, uh, some of our best ones had that entire collaborative team. Do you remember the round room? Um, yeah, the round room was fantastic, the Kiva. The Kiva, we called it, thank you. And it was a round room and people walk in and they're right away, they're taken aback. And what is that reason? Well, that means that when you're sitting together, you're collaborating. There is no front of the room, there's no back, you can't hide in a corner. Um, and so that collaboration was the key. Same type of seat, there was no head to the table. Yeah. So we were we trying had, to- We had this ride um, at the amusement park near us where we grew up called the Turkish Twist. And you'd get into it and it would spin you around and yeah. it's the wall and the floor would drop and people would puke on each other. Yeah. That's pretty much what happened in that room. <laughs> we called it the spin and barf where I'm from. But, yeah. but, uh, but you remember in there one time as a perfect example, okay, collaboration. And you talk about supply chain, Dennis. Do you remember we were having the shipping issues? We needed to be innovative about how to ship high dollar, multi-million dollar product from A to B to C, right? And we had already experienced a million dollar loss. And so the pressure was on, let's go figure this out. And we're all going through about how we can pack it better, how we can this and that. <clears throat> and the trucker, we have a trucker there and people are like, why would you have the, tr who's that guy, you know? And uh, we're in there talking and he goes, you know what? Um, you need to do air ride for starters. We're like, okay, we don't understand trucks that much, but we got it. And he said, uh, any, and you need to specify trucks built after 2015 and your, or trailers built after 2015. And we're like, why the hell is that? He goes, they changed the standard for air ride. That right. is your best. I guarantee you, you get a trailer that's 2014 or 2013, it's not going to be the top of the line. And we're like, one line in our contract on shipping says no trucks beyond older than 2015 solved half our problems. Right. Okay. And so you talk about collaboration in innovation, you have a solution together. That's like, that's where those two meet, right? And that's a perfect, we're all freaked out. We're like, that's about the easiest thing in the world to specify and we're guaranteeing ourselves we're gonna get the best equipment. And we'd, nobody in that room, as you said, John, putting the smart guys in there to fix it, we'd have never thought of that. So that's just an no, example. It's, it's, you know, people feel it's risky to get the customer in the room and the supply chain in the room and somehow they'll be left out or somehow they'll be found out. And I sort of always challenge, like, what are you afraid of? Um, sh you know, if you're, if you are a killer, you know, lean organization, you should be welcoming people coming through and telling you what's wrong. And then what could be better than being at the table with the customer, talking to them about what they need and what their tough problem is. The customer's tough problem is so underrated as an, as a topic that I don't even know how to begin. Because there's the issues for the client and then there's issues for the company. And if you can think about solving problems for the customer, right, that's going to create value and help them, you know, sell the innovation faster. You'll diffuse more rapidly. But if you also then offset that by the needs of the company, then what you've got is that perfect mix that you can come up with that helps you serve a need in the marketplace and also make a couple bucks and then move yeah. on to the next right. thing. Right. You know, so I think it's, it's, 
people are worried about intellectual property. People are worried about MOUs and non-confident confidentiality agreements. Great, put it all in place, man. Let's get in a quick MOU. Let's let's put it in NDA place. Let's talk. Because those collaborative things, um, when you get them from different perspectives, shift the game. We have six clients that are capstoning right now from innovation workshops. Four manufacturers, a college, and a service organization. And in four cases, paradigm shifted with the solution beyond what they assumed the solution would be because an independent non-industry feedback gave them an idea that shifted their whole, the whole thinking. Yeah, and we see that time and time again. You know, one of the, the most important things, and, and uh, Mike touched upon this before, is that whole notion of showing a little bit of patience, spending a little more time up front and not um, just running with the first viable solution. You know, um, we look at the first, first viable solution all the time and say, okay, great, we get an idea that can work. Let's run, 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 run. And then by the time you get to production, you've got a thousand things that you need to fix because you didn't really spend the time to figure out where, what those pitfalls were going to be and uh, you know, made it too complex, made too many parts. Uh, your supply chain ended up being too many. <clears throat> I think Dennis wants to say something. Oh. No, no, I, I, I was clearing my throat, I actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's great that we interrupted John's train of thought because I wanna ask him a quick question. So Johnny, <laughs> if the process needs to have the right people, I think that's what we just talked about. What else, is, what else are the key ingredients to uh, the process being successful? And we're not going to go heavy into what the process is per se, but enlighten us more about other important ingredients. So, so you need the but, people. Let me ask you, you've been quiet. Uh, I, so and I was going to ask you guys a question because, uh, Uncle D, you started off by saying a lot of people are talking about innovation and, uh, and they throw around that word, but they don't really know what it is. Um, Johnny Hustle saying, hey, there is a process uh, associated with it. If I had to put one word uh, to define innovation or one word to define successful innovation, uh, the word I would use is creativity. Uh, it's not the status quo. Uh, there is creativity uh, that is, is needed in order to solve a problem, right? And that's, that's what innovation's trying to do is meet the, the demand uh, of the customer, meet the demand of a problem. So, uh, what words would uh, you guys use? We tried to add one more layer to that and say that uh, it's not really an innovation until it's, it, it turns a profit. You know, yeah, it's going to generate revenue, profitable revenue. You're just, you're just ideating. It's a good idea. <clears throat> it's just creativity unless you're making money. Yeah. And, and you don't have to be making create, you know, be, you're not trying to take advantage of things, but that's what you're in business for. If you're a manufacturer, you're trying to make money. And if you're innovating a, a process change, then maybe it's about money savings. You know, you're, you're creating more, uh, more profit because you're, you're not spending as much to, to make the, the product. So Mike Floyd, I was recalling um, some of my thoughts about the last podcast with concurrent engineering, and we didn't use the term cost avoidance. Because oh, yeah. remember we used to talk about some of the concurrent engineering projects and how they avoid cost because we would come up with an optimal solution before we brought it to market. I wonder if people consider cost avoidance, avoiding a cost, you know, investing money now up front in the innovation, in the process, in getting people together and communicating the right way. Um, I wonder, I wonder what that, what role that plays. You know, uh we would think on the surface that it would play a huge role. You'd think that everybody sitting in the room would say, oh man, I'm glad you told us about that. I'm glad that you predicted that if we went forward with this current design or whatever, John, first feasible as John would say, <clears throat> that these big numbers that you're throwing at us, so I'm so glad you brought it forward and we'll avoid them. Oh, boy, unless you can quantify them real well, Dennis, I've seen people come up with million dollar cost avoidance issues that get no attention. Uh, it's, it's very subjective. It's somewhat ambiguous. Uh, I've, someone said, wait a minute, you got a millionaire, three millionaire, five millionaire. I mean, the whole program's worth four million. So how can we avoid nine million in cost on a $4 million job? I mean, so it gets, so, 
you're trying meetings over you're trying to convince people to go a different direction I, I i will just tell you right now for some reason in my experience using cost avoidance as a uh i won't say a weapon but let's say as a good data point to direct action and direct activity it's it falls surprisingly flat people unless it's very well quantified they don't believe it well, I have, I have a hard time with people jumping to conclusion and moving ahead and not coming up with other viable solutions. Mm -hmm. That's agreed. actually kind of the, a hitch point for me. In well, that's why two, two tenants I wanted to bring up, and, and I think it's something we have to talk about in that innovative circle, especially with engineers. I'm assuming our audience is going to be made up of some engineers. By nature, I wrote down two words, uh, actually, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a behavior. Uh, by the way, to Mike's point, creativity is a behavior. Um, you can't go take Creativity 101, 102, 201, 202 and come out with a certificate in creativity. So you've got certain players that come in with that creative mindset. Not everybody has it. So be careful when you load your, 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 your development team up. You've got to have people that have that creativity as a function, right? Usually they're open-minded as well. But uh, from an engineering perspective, uh, one of the traits I was looking for is what I call tolerance of ambiguity. And... I looked up the definition and this one word stuck out. And why, why do you want your engineers to be tolerant of ambiguity? And ambiguity is the quality of being open to more than one interpretation or one answer, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for most engineers, ambiguity drives them nuts because they don't have the answer. What do you mean we're ending the meeting? We haven't solved the problem. Well, no, we're going to go think about it and come up with some ideas tomorrow. That just drives them. They can't sleep. They come the next day, their hair's all up like this, and they got a cup of coffee. They're like, can we finally get to a decision today? It's, you're killing me. And the word that they used in this definition was inexactness. Hmm. That's like kryptonite to an engineer. Right. Inexactness. Did I hear you right? Are you kidding me? So they can't tolerate that inexactness of that process. And so they have no patience for that process. Oh, oh, I remember you telling me once that you had your, when both, when both of us had more hair, you would do your gel all spiky so that it would mess with the engineers because they all wanted to go one way. And they yeah. bounce them. <laughs> They're like, what the hell is going on here, man? And so oh, this, this inexactness thing, is yeah. something that people can't tolerate. They can't, they can't tolerate that you don't know, right? Yeah, they can't. And, and it's such a valuable phase of the program. Uh, you talk about innovation. Um, by the way, the tenets of, and this is where John would get to eventually here, I'm sure, is the tenets of an in innovative organization. Like you do a 5S assessment of a company, Dennis, you're looking at, okay, what controls do you have? You know, you're looking, you're looking against a fundamental standard and seeing how well they stack up to it, right? Well, you could do the same in an innovative environment. It's pretty open. It's, it's not super common sense, but what are the tenets of an innovative organization? For, for example, the collaboration, the, uh, the ability to fail that's not penalized, uh, that doesn't downgrade people, doesn't make them look stupid. That's another thing an engineer never wants to look at or have, ever have their idea called an ugly baby kind of a thing, right? So there's a lot of tenants, and I've been asked by some senior so presidents and stuff, on. or do we have an innovative organization in your mind? I said, absolutely not, and here's why. And so, John, I mean, I, collaboration is an element. It sounds good, but really, unless you're doing it right, you don't have it. I remember being in your facility at one point, and we were really struggling, we, it, the, the event, was filled with um, all engineers and these guys were brilliant 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 and uh, one of the guys was was finally getting really uptight and decided he was going to tell everybody right there and then what he was working on and what it was going to do and he took about five minutes to and he was pretty animated and some of the other people in the room said why on earth are you doing it that way and he was incredulous. And he looked back at them and said, I thought it was obvious to all of you this is the way I was going to go. Isn't this the answer? You know, so him, there was only one answer to, to solving that problem. And he didn't need to bother to tell anybody else how he was going to solve that problem because it should have been clear to everybody. Yes. yes. So does people need to be trained on the tolerance of ambiguity before you begin an innovation project? Maybe so. Maybe that's a great, a great addition to, uh, to that, or, or at least make sure you've got people on the team that do, do have some tolerance to amb ambiguity. Let's, and how do you build people, how do you build people's threshold for tolerance and inexactness? 
if uh, if I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be on this podcast with you. <laughs> oh come on! So. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's discussion. Uh, I think it's getting people uh, on the same page. It's setting those ground rules. Uh, it is, it's also correction. So yeah, there's the freedom to fail, uh, like Mike said, but it's also when, when somebody comes out, uh, like Johnny Hustle said, and says, well, hey, you know, why are you doing it that way? Uh, it's, it's the facilitator in the room or the leader in the room being innovative enough to say, hey, wait a second, you know, let's, uh, I know that that's probably not what you meant. Uh, maybe you said it's the tone that you said it was a little bit, um, uh, it, you know, in, in the wrong manner. Uh, it's learning from those kinds of discussions, not just letting it go and uh, in, in, in trying to keep uh, all of the the balls in the air right trying to keep everybody afloat so it's pointing those things out it's using people's uh own um biases and reactions to to help everybody else understand that it's okay that you said that but you know let's let's uh, discuss that so yeah absolutely i mean <clears throat> i've walked a lot of tight ropes in different facilitations and i've had my internal champion kind of pull me to the rescue mike a few times you've done it for certain um, I, I appreciate that part about the discussion. Your your point in getting everybody moving in the in the same direction is that collaboration piece that I think is is undoubtedly the one thing that gets. Once you get people to agree, then usually you get a better success. Right. Right. Now, in my example, those that team thought that they were collaborating. Mm -hmm. You know, so it really uh, had, it, it really heightened their uh, expectation of what collaboration really is. And uh, they changed their process after that on uh, how do they, how frequently do they talk about what they're doing and, and those kinds of things. And well, uh, I believe the term contract structure, egos, different politics drive the different dominant nature of other people in the mm -hmm. development party. I mean, how I, many times? I, uh, <clears throat> I used a term before, I think, very dangerous term in that collaborative environment called, um, uh, and this is this is on failure analysis and mission assurance stuff. Uh, they they did a lot of research on why things fail and how come you got to this point and it was bad and so forth. And they dug back, and uh, they there were there's a term they used that stuck with me. It's called and it's very very damaging. It's called excess professional courtesy. Hmm. Okay. The example they used was uh, an air uh, air traffic controller was talking to a pilot in a plane and he could see that he's flying into a mountain. This is a true story. He tells the pilot, uh, check your altitude, sir. He tells him five times, check your altitude. The pilot says, Roger, Roger. Plane goes into the mountain, kills whatever, everyone on board. They came back as an assessment. What was the root cause of that problem? They said excess professional courtesy. Turns out if you're an FAA controller and you want to keep your job, you never tell a pilot how to fly his plane. Never. Mm -hmm. If you said, sir, you're going to hit a mountain, you might want to you know, raise your elevation, your, your, your days are numbered. Don't tell me how to fly my plane and word would have had it, right? So we see that in these collaborative environments, Dennis. You talk about politics or whatever. Whoa, whoa. Did you see they're bringing the chief engineer in here and he's sitting over in the corner? That's All right. of a sudden, the nature of the, the I, I would tell you right now, that pours water on a collaborative environment. Sure. One of my favorite hobbies was dancing on landmines in those. In those yeah, you, yeah, you would. You go, you would, Dennis, you would say, how come every time you answer a question, everyone looks over at him? And what is your role? And everyone's like, oh, my God, Dennis is going to talk to him. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm the chief engineer. And you'd say, do you mind leaving? <laughs> Because I can tell you right now, you change the dynamics of this team. We were rocking and rolling until you stepped in here. And I'm like, you know what? This is the only guy in this whole building that can ask the VP of engineering to get up and leave the room. And it was for that reason. He just killed co the collaborative environment, didn't he? There was – you talk about professional courtesy. Nobody wanted to – you know, I mean, just kill him. They would usually leave. And it wasn't always a guy. Was, a lot of times it was a very high, powerful woman. Yeah. Yep. And then what would happen when that person did retreat? Actually, they come in and go, I want to play. Let me take my badge off. I like what you're doing. I just want to listen. Yeah. And then the moves would start moving. And then the lights on their eyes would turn. And we, how many times we see the program manager in the back go, what? I didn't even think about that, right? So, right. so yeah, it, it took that kind of discipline, perhaps. But it also showed the team. 
we're all on one level here. This is a single playing field. We're bringing everybody in this, uh, um, you know, Mike talks about the product life cycle, the process life cycle. We're going to bring every player of that process life cycle in here, and they're all going to be on a level playing field, or we're not going to get where we're going. So, right. so let's talk about the process real quick. When, when we talk about innovation, it's from concept inception to commercialization. Mm -hmm. It includes uh, prototype and design, right? Is that basically what we're talking about, John? That's, that's the, the duration? Yeah, but... Uh... But that doesn't mean that's where we end, end our considerations. Um, you know, part of the life cycle of the product should be in the consideration, even way up front. You the know, full life cycle should be. The right? full life cycle. You know, what happens when this widget is dead? Uh, and does, does it just go into the landfill? Uh, is it yeah. cycle? Is it, uh, you know, does it have uh, heavy metals that should not be leaching out into the environment? You know, what is it about this product that we, we have to understand its end of life cycle as well? Um, so we like to add all of those aspects in very, very early in the design. So if there are other ways of eliminating some of those adverse effects at the end of life um, or end of its life cycle, then, then we can. But if we never think of that up front, uh, and it'll, it'll, it'll just be, well, you throw it out. That's, isn't that what you do? You know, and some of these, uh, some of these systems that we're talking about, uh, they last 50 years, you know, so we got to be thinking about what happens to this, uh, this piece of equipment 50 years from now when it's end of life is, is, is over, uh, you know. But what if, uh, what if somebody thought about the, the, the end of life cycle of the water bottle, right, before they, uh, they said, hey, let's start bottling water. Where would we be today? Uh, there'd be another method of getting water. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's a good point. You know, I think a lot of times people don't consider the full life cycle. And, and to Mike Floyd's, you know, points about concurrent engineering in the beginning, reducing total life cycle cost, that uh, innovation process is that story, isn't it? it guys, it's the same. That's the story. That right. is. Um, so I challenge anybody that they think currently watching says, oh, my, 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 uh, my conceptual and my early design phase elements are all collaborative. Uh, uh, they're very innovative, this and that. Um, get a group of engineers together and talk about TPMs or technical performance measures. That's what everyone lives with. And you can right. only, you know, you got to pick your battles. You can only pick five to 10 maybe for any product element, even though there might be more. But try to inject life cycle cost, uh, John. Try to try to <laughs> try to inject obsolescence engineering, right? Uh, disposal. Uh, you'll get the looks in these rooms that go, "What the hell are you talking about? What does life cycle cost have to do with technical performance?" Okay. Absolutely. Or and, even the design cost into technical performance. No, it it, it belongs there. It does, but you can't get it seated. I mean, there's a lot of confusion even to this day in most of these environments as to why that's even on the list. And then right. who's going to govern it? And then how do you measure it? And, and those types of things. So, so, so the whole life cycle picture, that question, that's I think where a lot of companies fail is they have great designs for those elements that they're, they're circling the wagons around. But all these, it's, it's usually typically these perimeter things that they didn't think about that end up costing them either to make no profit or to have a, an unsuccessful product launch. Okay, so, so we've talked anecdotally about different elements of the innovation process. We haven't, we haven't dived into it quickly. So what I'd like to do is a quick round the horn. I'd like you to consider your thoughts, put them together in some sort of, not have to be a plus delta, but some sort of summary of thoughts. The audience is interested in knowing more about the process of innovation, and you've got one to two minutes to explain it. Johnny Hustle, you're first. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so um, I guess what I would want to make sure that they all understood is that uh, innovation is a process. There are many things to consider. Uh, the first thing to consider, of course, is solving your customer's tough problems and all the parameters around the customer's tough problems. Some of those things include things like we talked about today with the end of life cycle and also what the functionality of that product is going to be. Um, but also we need to e explain or understand 
uh, to the team and to management that this product also has value to the company, that it is going to ha hit a particular profit margin, um, that it is going to um, become a spokesperson or, or a spokesmodel or a spokes product for our company. You know, it's, it's going to be part of the brand builder uh, and, and all of those items that go around that. And then also there's a whole bunch of other um, com um, pitfalls that get into manufacturing that we need to avoid. So we want to look at things like complexity and, um, you know, limiting the number of parts and, and looking at uh, the different methods of, of uh, manufacturing and assembly to make sure that we are really thinking uh, long and hard about how to uh, remove as much of the cost from the production of that product as possible uh, and still meet all the needs. And then of course, there's all those items that go into the commercialization, which is another whole product in itself because now you've got marketing and sales plans and all those things right, that right. are, you know, <clears throat> It's, it's all of that. All right. So we certainly help a lot of companies out doing this and people can reach out to us. We're easy to find on LinkedIn. Mike Letson, your one to two minutes on those thinking about the innovation process and, and what you would like them to know. Yeah. To build off of Johnny Hustle there, uh, business case. So I look at innovation as a uh, tough solution to a problem, right? Because I can put band-aids on it. But if I want to step back and try to, 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 to create an innovative solution, it's going to take a lot more effort. Uh, it's the long-term solution. So what's the business case, right? What are we looking at uh, in, in being honest with that business case? It's not the pie in the sky or the hope that, uh, that you, know, you think this is going to be successful. The second aspect that I'd like to add to, uh, to that is risk. You know, what are the risks that we're dealing with now? What are the risks of, of taking an innovative approach, right? So, uh, you know, again, I may be, it may make more sense to, to just keep putting the Band-Aid on it rather than, uh, you, know, you know, creating some sort of artificial skin that, uh, um, you know, doesn't uh, allow the cut to, uh, to even occur, so uh, understanding that risk and saying, hey, when, when is the right time to, uh, to propose that innovative solution or start to design that innovative solution? So business case and risk. Thank you, Mike. That's, that's great insight, but I appreciate it. Mr. Floyd, same yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, geez, uh, I could key off of what Mike's talking about, what John's talking about. Mike re mentions risk now, and it's like, okay. Um, <laughs> that's a whole other thing, That's right? a whole other thing. Uh, I, I was driving today. I had to tell you my story about risk. I was mission assurance director for years, and, and I had a lot of reliability engineers working for me. And my, my senior guy comes in the office, and he goes, you know what I've learned about upper management and risk? I said, what? He goes, I could boil it down to one thing. I said, what's that? He goes, Managers are willing to accept any level of risk as long as nothing bad happens. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, can I use that? That's funnier than hell. And they'll, they're like, you know, turn it up, turn it this. So, so people aren't, I'll tell you, they just don't, they don't appreciate the element of risk in these development phases. It's really funny. So by the way, I wrote a couple well, things down. Got Rap a threshold, right? What's that? Everyone's got a threshold for risk. They do. <laughs> but if, if you're going to tell me nothing bad is going to happen, my threshold's way up there. So the bigger the innovation, the, the more evolutionary or revolutionary is, the higher the risk, right. the more uh, threshold for pain, the intestinal fortitude you've got to have. Exactly. I you agree. If you don't have the junk to do it, don't do it. It's another, it's another tenet of the collaborative and innovative environment that John's talking about. Exactly right. what you said, Dennis. But I'll tell right. you, the so cycles my, of. Help me with your concluding thoughts there. Okay. Just, uh, I, you know me on my side, I'm touting that front end of these programs, right? That's so, why you're here, buddy. Uh, well, uh, but, I'm, but I'm adding in everything that each of you were saying, okay? We're talking about, and then Mike just goes and throws risk in, and now my head's spinning up here. But anyway, I mean, it's everything. You look at the complexity factor, Dennis. We used to carry that forward, too. Number of parts, number of standard parts. How many parts are we using that we already have in stock? Right. Um, none. Okay, so what we're going to do here means we're going to have to buy everything brand new that we've never procured before. Well, yeah, but it really gives us the best signal integrity or something like that. You're like, wrong, wrong answer. So right. I'm sorry. I can't boil it down to one minute. You got me too fired up. It's, it's, I say the most important phase is those early phases. 
but you have to have the entire life cycle picture in that early phase or you're not going to be successful. Yeah, and people need to know what to do in the early phases. They can't just go about doing it the same old way because, um, you know, the habits haven't been developed and the new skills haven't been developed. So for me, thank you, by the way, Mike Floyd and Mike Letson and, and Johnny. If I could just calm Mike Floyd down, onions. Onions. Okay. I just want to calm you down. I apologize. All right. No, that's perfect. Well, that reminds me. I got to cook dinner tonight. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> right, right. So for me, I think if you haven't established a policy and a budget for innovation, then you're not ready. Right. So if you don't have a budget set aside, um, a war chest that you're willing to throw at this, um, then you're not prepared. And you know, you're not alone. You can get the R&D tax credit if you document your innovation development and you do it the right way and it qualifies by the standards of the IRS and so forth. But if you think that you're just going to come up with an innovation that diffuses rapidly and makes you a lot of money without a budget, you're just going to make incremental improvements next generation at best. Right. So I think for me, the risk threshold relates directly to that budget. And if you want to just do it with whatever you've got lying around, you're going to get some continuous improvement and that's what you're going to get. But if you throw some bucks at it to make sure that all of the Mike Floyd stuff happens up front in a way that proves that you are truly doing cost avoidance, then I think that you're going to be more able to delight your customer and put something forward that has value when you commercialize and, and brings you to a break even and return on investment faster. So that's my gem. Very nice. That plays into Mike's business case, which is a whole nother excellent topic. So th this is good timing guys for us to uh, sort of conclude. I really appreciate all of your input today. You know, we're really trying to build an audience that um, subscribes to our channel because they're interested to know more about the practical nature of being successful with things like the innovation process. So I'm grateful for our chance to be together for the first time as a, as a, a group of flying geese. And I will I'll look forward to seeing you guys all out there on, uh, on YouTube. So subscribe and like, and for now, I'm Uncle Dave. Peace. Peace.